Hey, my name is Nan Cohen. I had the wonderful opportunity to participate at the Spirit, Commerce, and Sustainability Conference, which was held here in Missoula, Montana, during the weekend of September 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Many people were responsible for bringing us the conference. The main sponsors of the conference were Women's Voices for the Earth, the Caring for Creation Network, National Center for Appropriate Technology, and the Montana Association of Churches. I want to thank all the presenters, all the participants, and all the sponsors of the conference. It's a great conference. The conference brings together people from within various aspects of the sustainability movement. Labor, community, spirituality, business, etc. It's very inclusive. The film crew included Cold Mountains, Cold Rivers, Rick Gold, and myself. I hope you like the show. Completion in the midst of action, and I like that idea. It's, it's when we're in the thick of it and the throes of being busy changing the world. Sometimes it's good to, to just settle in and be with ourselves and become recentered through some uh, act of con con contemplative practice of act of our own kind. But it also, uh, uh, I chose to reframe that. Uh, Peter didn't even know I was taking liberties with this. I think it actually the phrase originally might have come from Peter's work. But it occurs to me that sometimes I think we also, there's a risk of us becoming overly contemplative and spending too much time being um, in, in quiet, uh, introspective practice. In the meantime, the world rushes madly on, and so perhaps it's appropriate to stop and engage in some action in the midst of contemplation. Peter comes to us from a Russian, a Russian Orthodox upbringing. He became an evangelical minister during the 1980s. Before heading on to complete his master's degree in business administration, he decided to take a thousand mile long llama trek in the, I think it was in the Sierra Mountains? Uh, uh, Cascades. Cascades. And the Cascades. And during that time, he claims that he experienced something of an epiphany. He went in as a minister and he came out as an activist. And since then, that's become, uh, he's integrated those two quite successfully in a very exciting and promising way. He, uh, Because the llamas were Frank and Jesse, by the way, you should know that. People, I, I haven't had llamas, that's why Peter and I connected in that context earlier on. People sometimes ask us, do your llamas have names? Like, well, of course they do. Like, there are kids. So, so Frank and Jesse were, were his uh, spiritual guides, and I think that's more than just a little conversation in some regards. According to Peter, I went into the mountains, minister, came out an activist, an environmental activist. Uh, Peter's work's been featured in Outside, CNN, and on the Bearer News Hour, which the latter impresses me a lot. They all impressed me the last one particularly in this regard for that program. Uh, Peter and I met about seven or eight years ago, or I met Peter, I think. I'd be amazed if you would remember me. He just finished his stint as a marketing director or consultant, a marketing consultant to the International Lama Association. He did a <coughs> fine presentation at the Big Mountain for the Lama Conference. And I had no idea then that he was a minister. <coughs> And since I've visited with him over the course of the last couple of days, we could engage him for some period of time to discover that there really is an agenda there. But uh, Peter has a very novel and refreshing way, very uh, um, unorthodox, irreverent way of approaching his ministry. So I'll give you a few really welcome One of the things I do at 3 o'clock in the afternoon is celebrate the sacrament of caffeine. So, uh, <laughs> uh, partake with me. Uh, what I do uh, primarily, I'm now with a group called Target Earth. I had formed a group called Christians for Environmental Stewardship, and then we became part of a network called Green Cross. We had to give that name up because Gorbachev formed a think tank called Green Cross, and a medicinal marijuana group out of Seattle had the name Green Cross. And since most of the people I reach out to think all environmentalists are commies and dopers, uh, they had their proof every time they got on the internet. We could never get on the first 10 hits. We were like 75th, but well, we gave it up. Now I work uh, for a similar group, although I'm not as enamored with the name, called Target Earth. Uh, some people see a bullseye. Uh, but you know, it's really tough to find the name that uh, 
uh, makes it work. Uh, uh, most of my work is actually trying to help what I would define as Bible-believing Christians fall back in love with nature and become stewards and caretakers of the earth. So it's a pretty narrow uh, group, and it makes it a little awkward when I talk to a larger, more interfaith, or even um, you know, uh, ecumenical, even in the Christian context, uh, group. But this is a bit of a struggle. I was in Boise not too long ago, and, and, and a bunch of ministers showed me how proud they were, how cooperative they were. And they had a cross made out of pictures of all the church leaders in Boise. And on the bottom it says, what do all these people have in common? And I looked at it and said, white penises. Um, <laughs> you know, and the goal was they all share the same, the same uh, theology. But the truth is, I do represent what is uh, offensive to many people. And the, the fact is that I get heckled by the left and I get heckled by the right. Both groups have stereotypes. I'm too Christian for the environmentalist and I'm too environmental for the Christian. And yet our work is to build bridges. We are not trying to make Christians out of environmentalists. We are actively trying to make environmentalists out of Christians. And we do that by building on tradition, by building on scripture, by building on personal experiences people have. And this summer, uh, we went out and uh, Elizabeth, wave your hand there. Uh, Elizabeth at University of Montana, she went out with a crew of students to uh, a, a, new, a bunch of Christian rock festivals where we had this banner, Your Soul Meets the Wild, and we had uh, people sign up to protect roadless areas. It was very successful. We had over 6,800 uh, younger evangelicals um, sign up. And tomorrow, I don't know if you know this, Elizabeth, the letter signed by over 1,800 of them and a bunch of postcards are being presented to the Forest Service in Washington, D.C. And we muddy the water because we're fishing from the same pond that the uh, Christian Coalition does. And, uh, and yet it's a, younger, it's a younger audience, and it's an audience that says, wait a minute, my faith is about being genuine, my faith is about being holistic, my faith is about being real. Um, Target Earth, our mission statement is, um, in a short note, it's serving the earth, serving the poor, but from a functional sense, it's we work to help Christians rediscover the biblical call to love, serve, and protect the earth and the poor. Um, and we talk about the poor too. And I think the environmental community should be chastised at times for leaving people out of the equation, just as many folks uh, have left, and many folks in the uh, church community have left the environment out. Um, I tell the story, it's now become my infamous nipple story, but I was at a, a rock festival and this a Christian rock festival, and this guy walks by and he goes, dude, the earth doesn't matter because we're not animals. And you know, the spirit of glibness fell upon me, and as he's walking <laughs> away, I yelled out, no, no, my friend, you've got nipples. You know, I mean, that makes you, we've done penises and nipples already, and I haven't been in this for less than two minutes. Uh, and we go, you know, uh, you have nipples. I mean, were you asleep in biology? You know, you're a mammal. Um, my, by birth, body hair, milk. And this person was so disconnected from the earth that they couldn't, they couldn't make the connection uh, that this matters. Um, I, uh, I like aggressive outreach. I like to go to Promise Keepers meetings. I like to go to uh, um, the creationist meetings where they have their big old young earth debate and they're all arguing is earth 8,000 years old versus 9,000 years old. And I'm like, does this really matter? I have this little bumper sticker. We had, you know, the Jesus fish, and then you had the Darwin fish, and then you had the Jesus eating the Darwin fish. Well, we put a salmon inside a fish and said, extinction isn't stewardship. And we're able to go into a very rigid set of beliefs and building off that rigid set of beliefs, saying, I mean, what's up with this conversation? Even if you convince me that the earth is 8,000 years old, how does that impact the fact that we're driving to extinction uh, what God called good? That the first blessing in the Bible was to the fish. Shouldn't we be measured? Uh, shouldn't our stewardship be measured by how we take care of the earth? And, and uh, <clears throat> they, there's really very little wiggle room uh, within Scripture for the destruction of the earth. And what hasn't happened is people haven't challenged the false intention. That's part of our job. We try to challenge it. We try to challenge it in love. We challenge it in Scripture because 46% of Americans self-define as Bible-believing Christians. That's 137 million people. Well, from a purely marketing standpoint, because I wear these two hats. I wear my preacher hat, and I wear my marketing hat, and they seem a little disconcerting for folks. Which one is it? Well, 
maybe no one's watched enough Sunday morning TV, but you know, they're not that far removed. Um, and uh, the truth is that you can take a strong belief system and you can show people the inconsistency of the belief system and say, look, you know, and it's called cognitive gap theory. And we like to talk to people that say, I believe the Bible is the word of God. And I believe I can do what I want to the earth. And we say, you can't have both of those beliefs. You're gonna have to pick one. And we're doing effective work getting people to recognize that the Bible calls them to stewardship, that the Bible calls them to simplicity, that the Bible calls them to sacrifice. We're not here today to try to, like, again, like I said, make Christians out of anybody. We're not here to make people literalist in the Bible. Um, I'm talking about action in the midst of uh, contemplation because my story is a relatively um, uh, uh, simple story. I went into the woods and fell in love with the wild and uh, have come out and now work to help other people fall in love with the wild. I was coming out in Outside Magazine is we go to these rock festivals and we take Christian bands, rock bands. Or there's a band called Valley Dows which is a Celtic punk band, you know, with dreadlocks, and the guy's got bones in his noses, and, you know, and it's like angry bagpipe music. Uh, <laughs> and they talk about justice, and they talk about what we're doing when we hurt the poor. And it, it doesn't take very much for them to realize the same powers that hurt the poor are the same powers that hurt the, the wild, that hurt the earth. And what we try to do is rise up a voice amongst the evangelical, or it's really a younger audience to say, you know, no, no, this isn't right. This doesn't feel like faith to me. This feels like greed, and this feels like destruction. Uh, so it was really, uh, it was really a lot of fun with the uh, um, with the group. We go. I leave in about three weeks from Papua New Guinea, and I, I've been invited there by indigenous Christian leaders. Uh, now, the anthropologists that you all went at this, but Papua New Guinea is now viewed as ninety-three percent Christian. But the tribes own the land. They own 97% of the land. So you've got tribal Christian landowners, and they don't know what to do. They don't know what's right. Um, and we go there, and we have these seminars in the Bible colleges and say, your ancestral love of the land, that tradition that goes back thousands of years, is wisdom, and honor the land. And I was uh, teaching my friend James the word that they have for do not hurt the earth is bugarat bush. So if you're going to remember that, I'm the Australian, so I spent a little time there. Uh, but don't bugger up the bush. And, and you've got tribal people saying, no, this isn't right for me, for, for us to hurt the earth. And it's against everything in the core of their, uh, their being. Um, and when I was there, I met a man. Uh, he actually, they invited me over because he formed a group. He's a Franciscan. And he formed a group called Christians for Environmental Stewardship, modeled after the first work I did here. And uh, he took me to... Uh, six cities, and I spoke to people. There are over 7,000 folks, and now it's caught on where there's a national movement of people saying that they want to um, protect the earth. But, but they have a word. You know, if, if they call you a coconut, it's not a good thing. A coconut's probably what? Brown on the outside and white on the inside. And I said, well, what's a, what's a white man mean to you? Because it's an insult. And they said, well, a white man has no love of their people. And the love of their land. A white man loves money and is greedy. And uh, I brought Yacht on a tour of the United States. He actually, in, in a asking a question to Winona Ledoux at a conference, he leaned into the microphone and he goes, I am a Christian man. I love my God. I will die for my faith. And he says, But I am, I mean, he's like this big, you know, and he goes, I am also a tribal man and I love my land. I will die for my land. These cannot be separated. How in America can they be? And then he leans into the microphone and he says, you came and you taught us about money, but you did not warn us about greed. It was a profound moment because he was the man who they came in and they took his elders on the first airplane ride to the first city. This is an oral tradition. They don't read and write. And they made him this whole promise, oral. And then he X'd a document that was totally different. They came in and they took 75% of the trees from Yacht's mm -hmm. tribal lands. But Yacht got money for it. He got $5, you know. Oh, wow. And a can of corned beef is $6. So, you know, one good possum in the tree would have done way more than that. Yacht became an activist and Yacht became angry. Yacht took me to a group of Episcopalian priests. Now, in Papua New Guinea, 
Like when the Germans landed here, the British sent their ships, and the Dutch went over here. So you got Dutch reformed over here, you got Episcopalians, you got Lutherans. It's all been fairly well chopped up. But I sat under this house, the house was stilts, and uh, a tribe had lost its land to a timber company illegally. And the elders were all gathering, and they were all Episcopalians. And I remember this elderly Episcopalian priest, he stood there with head tall, collar on, he goes, I am prepared to shed blood. I thought there, I sat there and said, well, you didn't say whose blood. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, I can't need your blood or, uh, you know, somebody else's blood. But I sat there and I realized one of the reasons that we really struggle as a people is that we don't understand what it means to be a people or to have a place and to have land. So I go back in, uh, in a couple weeks to do this uh, symposium around the country, which I'm really excited by. It's just a tremendous opportunity. Greenpeace, who's partnering with me on this, much to the chagrin of my fundamentalist friends. Uh, but at Target Earth, we made a plan. Well, let's stand with anybody who serves Europe and who serves the poor. And you don't have to pass a creed to get a show. You know, we'll work to, to protect uh, the earth and the poor. But they asked me, why do you love the earth? Why are you a white man who loves the earth? And it happened on my thousand mile path trip. There was a place in the middle of Washington State called Big Crow Basin. And you came down, it was a misty day as the Cascades get, where you can't see that far out ahead. And I came down a carn into uh, this big bowl, this big grassy meadow. Hundreds, if not thousands of crows flew up. And I realized, wow, they've been here for a long time because it's named Big Crow Basin, you know, so I know why it was named. And that night I, I spent the night, and, uh, and about two o'clock in the morning, the moon came out and it was full. And I woke up to the eerie sound, and I didn't know what it was, and it scared me, and I got up, and I got out of bed, and it was a herd of elk had come into camp. You've heard bull elk bellowing. Each time you hear it, you're going, I don't know what it is. And I stood in the moon shadow of the trees, and I watched this elk, and I watched this elk lift his head, and I watched it cry out. There must have been 30 or 40 of them, but this big bull elk, and he just cried out again. And maybe it's because I was uh, Pentecostal, but I got the goosebumps. You know, if you get the goosebumps, it must be God. It's kind of the proof. Uh, and I stood there and I said, you know, it was a moment of worship where in the midst of creation, I remember the verse when God created the earth. It says, and God saw that it was good. Later I discovered that that word good is Hebrew. It means full. It means complete. It means whole. And it's like an artist steps back from their art and says, Shalom. And I looked out and I realized that God had done good, that the wild was sacred because the wild expressed God's wisdom and God's creativity. Two days later, I was in an area of clear cut going up the Snoqualmie Pass, which for two days I walked and there were no trees. And all of a sudden I became angry. Maybe it, I think it was because I had fallen so in love with the wild. I mean, I'd been on the, the trail by that time 65 days. It's not like I hadn't had many, many nights alone, but something happened that day. And I was trying to read a chapter in Proverbs every day, and I was on the last chapter, the 31st. I'd done it already twice, but I found a verse that said, speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. And that's where I like to tell my preacher friends when I was born again again, you know? I mean, I had this calling that says, you know, who speaks for the wild? You know, who speaks for the trees? Who speaks for the salmon? And if it's not the church, if it's not the people of faith, then who? You know, and, and I think um, it's when I got, I got my love and my love and my contemplation forced me to take action. You know, I came back and the 104th Congress got elected a couple years later and there was a lot of Bible bombing. And uh, there was a lot of anti-environmentalism. And I got, I got angry and I started fighting back. I found out I was pretty good at fighting back. Uh, And, and we came up with this bumper sticker, if you love the creator, take care of creation. You know, and people went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Now, I hear in Montana, I'm sure there's still a lot of anti-environmental rhetoric that happens, especially from um, some people, probably not from church pulpits, but from people within church. I just cannot help understand how anybody who believes in the creator stand by and watch creation be destroyed. What can, can well, I mean, is it foolishness? I mean, I, I, I cannot understand how somebody can justify 
being anti-environmental, and yet it happens, um, it happens all the time. So our mission statement for Target Earth, then, is rediscover the biblical call to love, serve, and protect the earth and the poor. And I want to unpack that just a little bit and talk about love. Um, one of the first things, whenever I, we go to these festivals, and Elizabeth will tell you, she's probably heard it over and over again, is that, hey, we're not supposed to worship the earth, you know. And I'm like, when is stewardship idolatry, you know. Uh, and so I realized that some, I used to say, you know, protect the earth, and then I would say, appreciate and protect the earth. And then I started saying, no, let's just call it what it is, let's love the earth. And it's time for, that's the power of people's faith. In the spiritual disciplines uh, program we had here, you know, uh, the power of faith is it can go into that little box, be a Buddhist, be a Muslim, be a Christian, and can talk to the heart, maybe quicker than other disciplines, maybe than the cognitive. I mean, there's ways that people feel things. I have a dear Catholic friend. You know, you light a candle, light some incense, and she's in a special place because she's not just worshiping with her mind. She's worshiping with her nose and her eyes. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the Celtic Christians used to have a discipline they called tuning the five-string harp, which is bringing all the senses in, into harmony and to worship um, with God. So there's three great relationships. I was supposed to have overheads, but I had problems with overheads. So and I, I'm going to have to pretend, you know, visually as I do these uh, circles, but just real simple theology is, you know, there's us as people or as a church or as individuals, uh, but in, in the relationship we have with God, I have God here, uh, and that's what a lot of churches spend a lot of their time talking about, individual relationships with God and all that. Um, and this relationship, the rela and then over here we've got kind of overall humanity, but the relationship between God and humanity, uh, according to scripture, was one of fellowship. Uh, you know, and uh, <clears throat> for you ask people, where does the earth fit in this? You know, the Bible tells us, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So there's this little triangle of love, so to speak. And then you go, but what about the earth? Where does the earth fit into this? You talk to some wise use movement folks, and they say, oh, well, no, no, the earth is under humanity. I mean, I had a preacher tell me, you know, uh, um, God, you know, only cares about human souls, and that, uh, you know, God gave us the earth to do with what we want, and we can do, I mean, as a matter of fact, Ken and I had a little running debate in the newspaper. Uh, and, uh, but the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So then we have this relationship. Now remember, if you're sitting here and you're not a Bible-believing Christian, bear with me, because this is, you know people who are. And this is, uh, this is an argument that at this point has really uh, worked. I mean, because it's it's scriptural. Now, if you believe in scripture, a scriptural argument is very powerful. If you don't believe in scripture, then it's obviously less powerful. It's kind of like a constitutionalist, you know. I mean, I know people that, you know, the Constitution says. And so a theological argument has to be based on um, the, the, the suppositions that are used for that faith. Uh, but then the relationship between God and the earth is ownership. This is where the wise use movement says we have private property rights, and we go. And then my Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You know, my Bible says the land is mine. You are but aliens and renters. You must provide for the redemption of the land. So God owns the earth. And then the relationship we have between someone who has authority but doesn't have ownership is stewardship. And so the church is comfortable with the concept of stewardship when it comes to you know money. They're comfortable with the concept of stewardship when it comes to um, certain activities. The old joke, I don't do a smoke drink or chew, and I don't date girls that do. Uh, it was like the little maxim if you were in Sunday school. There's another joke, we, well, I won't even go there. Um, I'll tell you later. Uh, uh, and so people, uh, people get confused. I think there's been this belief for the last couple hundred years, since we really begin to see the earth as inputs to an economic process uh, that says, you know, I mean, I've had people tell me God made the earth for us to use. And I'm saying, oh, quit thumping your Bible. Start reading it. You know, because that's not what the Bible says. Um, so we have this covenant. When, when the ark landed with Noah, how many of you know the covenant? You, you know the covenant? Uh, and I always thought it was a covenant between God and Noah. It wasn't a covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and every living thing that was with you. 
all the wild animals, all the domestic animals, all the birds of the air. This was a covenant between me and the earth. So then, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, that scripture is pretty compelling or pretty damning, depending on how you look. Because what it says is that God has a covenant relationship with the earth and with people in the earth. We are not separate from the earth. It's not to have a covenant with people and the earth. It's a covenant with the earth, which is made up of people and the rest of creation. Scripture also specifically calls out wild. And that's why I particularly have a love of wild. I mean, and I think a lot of the fights we fight um, reflect the, the, the powerlessness that the wild has. You know, we work with a lot of poor, uh, in both in Camden, New Jersey, and Belize, and Hawaii, and Papua New Guinea. And one of the things that the poor seldom have is a voice. Same with the wild. The wild doesn't have a voice. I have fought groups like the Alliance for the Wild Rockies and Greenpeace and the Sierra Club, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, and all my friends in the environmental community. As a matter of fact, if I could take a cross-country bus trip, I'd rather take it with environmentalists than with fundamentalists, <laughs> let me tell you. That. Not much fun in fundamental. Uh, not much mental either. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but I believe that that uh, love of creation is not it's not idolatry. We are wired to love nature. I llama pack with my llamas all the time, and my llamas have yet to look at a sunset and go, "Ooh, cool!" You know, they're just two. They're all the world's a salad bar to a llama. You know, all they're looking for is uh, what can I eat next. I wonder what this looks like. But I, I, this came to me when I was in Yellowstone, and I just saw a line of cars and everybody standing there taking pictures of the buffalo just in awe of the bison running through and hoping there'd be a bear, hoping there'd be a wolf. But we were made in the image of God to appreciate what God called good. So this fear of somehow worshiping nature is so bogus. I was made to love creation. And what I did when I found my heart again was celebrate this freedom to be even more human by finding the love of nature. I think everybody here, the problem is this is the choir. Everybody's here because at some point where we're, we're there's someone I know with the Wilderness Society said to me, I have never met one environmentalist who isn't a spiritual person. That's so true. And part of our spirituality is a connection to the earth. And my job is to help Christianity, even traditional evangelical Christianity, rediscover that earth-based connection. And it's there, and it's scriptural, and it's historical, and it makes common sense, and it's there in Buddhism, and it's there in Muslim, it's there in Judaism, it's there in pagan, and we, you know, it's one of the common threads in almost all faiths. But it's time for the majority to also find their voice. And I say that because, uh, not that I endorse the majority over the minority, but if we can get the church, the Christian church, to actively stand up for creation, we can change the politics. You know, we have where we're at. Uh, there's a verse in Job. Oh, let me see. Little clipboard. I have a little clipboard. I have a little clipboard. Oh, no. Oh, oh, here it is. There's a verse in Job that says, Speak to the earth and it will teach you. That the hand of God has done all this. Sorry for all this. It, the, I use a translation that's very commonly accepted in the evangelical community, but it's a little less gender friendly. And it says, In him is the life of every creature and the breath of all humanity. Uh, but uh, so part of what we do is we help Christians love creation by taking them out. We do lake restorations. We do huckleberry restorations. I do a thing with the llamas and little kegs of beer. We call them keggers for Christ. And what we go <laughs> we go into the mountains with these bands, and we I cook Greek food, and we eat baklava, and we drink a nice nut brown ale, and and I. I show them some Bible verses they've never really seen about the trees praising God. And I say, close your eyes. Now, can't you just feel? Can't you feel? And you know what happens? Is people cry. And one band in particular, Five O'Clock People, has now got their CD and their special thanks to Peter and all at Target Earth. And they travel to these festivals and they talk about that there's a group they work with that's standing up for the special places and the wild places. And, uh, you know, we're starting to see this begin to really catch on. And a joke we have is, what do you call a community-wide paradigm shift? A revival. <laughs> so maybe we're seeing a revival 
of kind of a birth-based connection. Now, it's done fully within the context of Bible-believing Christianity. But it's a birth-based connection, one that's based in love. Uh, and so we find that people do love. I, I have a friend named Jim Davidson. Jim was a famous, uh, very wealthy plastics importer. Has some goodies in his Williams Sonoma catalog, and you know he, he did their cooking implements he imports. But he went on one of these kind of spiritual sojourns, and he sat there under a tree for 15, 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, in the weeds, he saw a turtle. And this turtle had a little golden eye, and he began to stare at the turtle, and um, he began to weep. Not the turtle, but my friend Jim. And at that moment, Jim, his life has changed. Um, his wife can't understand what's going on. I married an industrialist. <laughs> you know, what is happening here? Uh, but Jim is dedicating his life to protecting the wild. You know, and it took 15 minutes of being alone for the first time intentionally. And he fell in love with it. So most of the time, I'm talking not to people who are comfortable with the concept of loving nature, but people who are quite suspicious about the concept of loving nature. And it's this lack of holism. It's this hierarchical thinking. This is if I love God, then really I can't love people. And if I'm loving Earth, then somehow I'm not loving God. Well, you know, can we love God and destroy what God calls good? I don't, I don't see it. Can we love our neighbors and destroy what our neighbors need? I don't see it. So it's the third leg of the stool, which is that we are called to love and care for the earth. Uh, we've got a long time, and I'm going to be done like way before an hour and 40 minutes is over. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the disciplines then for learning to love nature. Um, again, the Celtic Christians call it tuning the five-string heart. But we'll go out with folks and, you know, smelling the different pine leaves. You know, some are more lemony, some are more piney, you know. Smelling them, smelling the flowers, and just closing your eyes. And can you spend even five minutes worshiping God with your nose? Well, it's pretty easy. You know, I have this resin incense, frankincense. I'll put it on a little, little burning ember and say, look, you know, this was always a part of the worship of the Hebrew and even the early liturgical churches, you know, because incense was kind of the, the offering to God, and smell this incense. And um, you can do it with your ears when you're quiet in the forest. Then you realize the forest isn't that quiet. It's just there's little things you hear. And you can start to feel peace. And I really think that's what the world is dying for. It's dying for some peace, consumerism. I mean, Tammy Faye Baker, remember her? When I have regret, I love to shot. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, all right. <laughs> I don't like your depressed. Um, um, the Celts also had a tradition um, called knowing or the, the thin place. And that was a place in nature where they would pray on a regular basis. And the wall between them and God would be thinner. So they call it the thin place. So I want to go, we're, we're looking at doing a tour with uh, five o'clock people. We may come to Montana so we can outreach to the churches, but it's called Knowing the Thin Place Street. And you know, I, I think everyone should go out to a roadless area or a wilderness area. Maybe pile up a little pile of rocks in the Hebrew wilderness altar. And just have a thin place. Have a thin place where you take your kids. Have a thin place where you take your grandkids or your great grandkids. And that becomes a place where you go. And you just feel the wall between you and God be a little bit thinner. There'd be a little bit more of a, of a connection there. I'm addicted to it personally. I mean, I had a chance to move to Philadelphia. <laughs> oh yeah, right, I contemplated that long and hard. Uh, not a chance. I need my llamas. And I need my places. I, I have what I call the where I want, do I want my ashes scattered. Um, I'm narcissistic enough to want to be buried like with a big monument so people are really wearing out weed whackers, keeping my tombstone uh, clean. But I'm probably going to end up going uh, the scattering my ashes. So I've got three places on the day. I want five places where my ashes will be scattered. Those are my sacred spots. You know, This is not non-Christian. This is celebrating the Creator and celebrating creation. One of them is this extinct volcano where I took outside magazines this band in a keg of beer. Um, so the, the article should come out next month, I think. So uh, I'm kind of excited by it. Um, we also do a discipline called Opening the Book of Nature, which is a look at kind of understanding the virtues, which are longer disciplines of silence, of meditation, of 
walking. Now we're talking uh, churches that aren't necessarily comfortable with silence, you know, and it's a new discipline for many people to go out and, and be quiet in nature and try to hear. And yet, you know, what, what is the secret of loving nature? Well, I think it's easy. It's just to go slow down, to open up, to be intentional, to learn to listen, and then something magic happens. We just become bigger. Our hearts become bigger. So the first thing Target Earth does is try to help people learn to love the earth and to learn to love the poor. And we'll take people on cross-cultural trips. We had a group of college students in Mexico, and there was a shack. It was like the biggest shack I'd ever seen. It was like, how could people live this way? And they were sneaking up to take a photo of the shack. And the door opened. And this little girl came out. She must have been five in a pink dress. She's just dancing like a ballerina all over her front. Dirt. You know, just dancing. And everybody was humble. Everyone said, Lord. So this one, my friend from New Guinea came over. And I'm telling him, well, you know, I'm an environmentalist. I'm too Christian for the uh, environmentalist, too environmental for the Christians. You know, we're pretty poor. And then we're in my kitchen. He goes, well, what does this do? I go, well, that makes my coffee. <laughs> What's that do? That grinds my coffee. <laughs> what about this? Well, that heats it up in the microwave. And then that washes my dishes and that grinds my ice. And all right. All right. I'm richer than 99% of the world has ever been in the history of humanity. You know. So part of loving the earth, loving the poor, is to find our heart again. And I think that's something that the communities of faith can offer, both the environmental community and can offer society as a whole, is a chance to find their heart again, to find their heart, to make it bigger, and to protect it. The second point, then, is serving. If we love, then we serve. It's a concept of the serving king. You know, we have the, uh, the you know, the, the metaphor of Jesus. It's not, well, it's not, I guess it's not a metaphor, but the principle of, of washing the feet, and the, the, the greater being the least. And so this concept of the servant, uh, servant king, there's a Bible verse uh, in Matthew that talks about stewardship. Uh, I've got to find it here. I wrote it down, uh, page 17. And it says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food in their proper time? says, who then is the faithful and wise servant? If I'm preaching in a church, I'll remind them, you know, you can be a foolish and greedy servant. It's a choice. That, be, you know, and, and I, I sometimes fight the, uh, oh, what's the word I would want to use? Uh, I mean, the whole kind of concept of dominion, you know. And people debate, do we have dominion or don't we have dominion? Is, is that what the word means? I think, oh, give me a break. You know, whether God gave it or we took it, we got it. You know, with bulldozers and chainsaws and dams and nets. And it's not a question of do we have power over nature. The question is what is our heart over nature. And so what we're doing is we're spending so much time debating whether or not we can do destruction to the earth. I assume we can because I've seen it, you know, over and over again. And so we're saying we have power over nature. Will we be wise? We used to name our daughters after the virgins. There still are. I don't know if there's any faith, hopes, joys. Here, but this word wise used to be translated as prudent. A few prudences anymore. Maybe somebody's grandmother was a prudence. You know, that's a virtue that we no longer honor. You know, what will we name them now? Consumerism. You know, <laughs> uh, mall rat. Uh, you know, and, and so I, I struggle because I go, what happened? Why isn't the church struggling to be faithful? What? Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus warn us about the dangers of faithful stewardship. You know, the Bible does warn us about greed and materialism and loving money and loving things. So um, we have a choice to be faithful and wise. And this says that the master has put in charge of the servants in his household. So the whole point of your soul needs the wild that we talked about was the wild is part of the household of God. You know, over and over throughout scripture, God specifically calls out a place for the wild. You know, so many of the saints went into the wild. Jesus went to the wild. You know, this verse right here is, Jesus went into the wilderness and prayed. And I like to say, good enough for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I fight for wilderness. That's why I fight for roadless areas. Because uh, uh, I found my soul there again. You know, life has a way of chipping at us and wearing us down. 
you know, making, you know, just taking the joy out of life. And somehow just being out in nature can really refresh us. But because I love nature, then I'm called to serve nature. I have power over nature, but you know, having power doesn't give us the right to do what we want. And that's how we somehow confuse this, this American work ethic, you know, or Asian work ethic. Or, you know, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Ishmael, you know, the taker work ethic that says, I have the power to take, therefore I will take. My friends from Papua New Guinea, they don't see this. They don't see the earth as serving them. They call their mother. And my friend Yat says, my mother gave me everything. Gave me papaya. Gave me, you know, everything I need to live. And then he says, you Americans eat a lot of protein. <laughs> and I go, yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, because the mother didn't give them lots of protein. The mother gave them lots of starch and lots of fruit. Uh, but we're called to be faithful and wise, and we're care to call to care for the servant, I mean, the other members of the household. So the person who was in charge of the household, who had power over the household, was called to serve the other members, to make sure they had food at the proper time, to make sure, here's my point, that their biological needs were met, that what they needed to thrive, that stewardship of the wild has to be measured by the right or the needs of the wild. What does the wild need? If I'm being a steward over forest for tree pole, that's different than being a steward for bull trout, or for lynx, or for grizzly bear. I'm a big fan of um, a local group here, the Alliance for Wild Rockies, and their, uh, their bill they have called NARIPA. I don't know how many of you are familiar with NARIPA. I've got some of these here. And it's saying that we need to protect these ecosystems right here. You know, and it's, it's kind of complex, and I'll just use this as an example. But they're saying stewardship of the Northern Rockies is that, you know, has to be measured by the needs of creation. You know, and I believe that, you know, there's a verse, this is one of my favorite verses in Psalms. In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Well, that means grizzly bears are part of the wisdom of God. Bull trout, where we live, marble merlet, spotted owl and salmon. I was down in Austin, Texas, because Lordy, they found an endangered salamander. <laughs> that meant all them rich folks up in the hill country couldn't build their mansions. You know, and that the problem was these were progressive dot com folks, too. And it's like it's only a salamander. And so I went down there and held these rallies and said, you know, it's not just the salamander. It's the salamander that represents the wisdom of God. That verse is profound because it says, in wisdom you made them all. My faith is built by ecosystems. I look at the way ecosystems work, and we got this spotted, I mean, in the old growth, we've got this uh, little bowl that runs up on the top, the red bowl, and it eats dug fur seeds. And some of them fall down, and it never comes down. Then there's a little bowl that runs on the ground, it's like a little mouse, and it eats the seeds that fall down, and it also eats truffles. And then it poops these little, perfect little packages of doo-doo, dug fur seeds, and mushroom nematoids. And it allows the pine trees to grow in environments that they couldn't do it otherwise. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> how can I destroy what I can't create? I have no right. That is the ultimate of arrogance. I love whenever I have uh, friends in the church, you know, to threaten that I'll stand up and yell blasphemer, blasphemer, because it really kind of trips up a good sermon. Uh, <laughs> but in a way, that's what we've done to creation. We're blaspheming creation every time we drive species to extinction. And instead, we work then to serve the earth. We do it in numerous ways. We do it, um, we do it by, uh, uh, first of all, we do it by the realizing that we're called to serve. That again, it's not just something we can do. There's no such thing, I believe, as non-stewardship. You're either a good steward. Or you're a bad steward. If you read the parable uh, in Matthew 25, it talks about you know the three the talents. I don't know how many of you know that uh, thing. And, and the one that was condemned was condemned for what? For burying the talents were money, but were for burying his talent, doing nothing with it, not squandering them. You know, it wasn't blowing it on prostitutes and booze and you know did nothing with them and was condemned. It's actually Jesus uses almost the harshest words in the Bible. He says, I'll chop you up and I'll throw you in the place of the hypocrites. So we think, because I get this all the time from churches, well, you know, I agree with you, Pete, but this is political and economic. 
and I don't want to go there. So I'm sticking with the things that matter. Well, Revelation 11, 18, remember, say this after me. Revelation 11, 18. He says, he will reward those both great and small who have honored his name and will destroy those who have destroyed the earth. You know, everyone quotes the dominion verse up front. They don't quote the accountability verse in the back. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a powerful phrase. It says that the opposite of honoring the name of God is destroying the earth. And the lack of stewardship doesn't absolve us from being accountable for our stewardship. I, I mean, my environmental friends always call me the earth third movement. You know, uh, and I'll tell you, yeah, that's fine. I'm in the top three now. You know, I think we, this was even discussed. If you did an average church event, said, how many of you have ever heard a sermon about the earth preached? You know, the only hands up would be UCC, Episcopalian, <laughs> some Presbyterian, the occasional unity. You know, show me a Southern Baptist person who is saying, I believe the Bible. Well, what's up with this? You know, it is so clear that we are called to care for what God calls good. So recognize we are called to serve. <coughs> Power is not right. And I believe that we need to serve from a place of love. The shepherd who loves the sheep cares for the sheep. The shepherd who doesn't love the sheep is a hireling. We, have some, we share something in common. We love our animals. I mean, I have, when, when Jesse died, I, have to, I, I skinned him so I could wear him every Halloween when I go to the barbarian. Uh, and I had to pay for the butcher. The butcher skin, and the butcher skin like ten things by noon. And I'm trying not to cry, you know, because like this is Jesse, but I know it's not going to help my image in the small rural community to be crying at the butcher shop uh, <laughs> as he's skinning my animal. But I'm thinking, you know, I watched so many sunsets while this animal chewed his cud. But you know, I love these creatures. They make my heart full. They make life, you know, more exciting. Um, so because we love, then we serve. Uh, and again, one of the ways we serve is by, uh, we need to look at ways as individuals to serve. You know, recycling is an act of worship. You know, it really is. We're finally getting recycling at some of these Christian rock festivals. You know, it's, you know, after all these years. Uh, and, uh, you know, we serve through our income. I need people to join Target or I need people to join the Alliance for Wild Rock. I need people, you know, every one of us should become a major donor for at least one organization. You know, where we say, you know, if you go to church, maybe it's your church. I can people with churches sometimes and think that if they're not talking about care for the earth, throw a little coin my way. Um, but I think it's important that we serve with our income. We serve in our lifestyles. Uh, we serve in our volunteer time. If you're not an activist, and that's the next thing we're going to talk about, it's amazing what a little phone call does at the right time change policy. Um, and we need to learn to serve as a community. We need to learn to serve as a nation. I was kind of glad to see the Jubilee thing start, but it seems to have, to some degree, fizzled where we began to release the debts in third world countries. I've heard there's still some stuff happening, but, uh, you know, we've got the privilege of being able to be charitable. You know, it is better to give than it is to receive. And it's time for us to be living it. And I, I applaud the environmental community um, because you know how many environmentalists have master's degrees and live on less than twenty thousand dollars. You know, and you know the environmental community to me is an exciting community because there is a lot of consistency and walking the talk. People get mad when the environmental community oversteps their bounds. Maybe when they throw a salmon in Helen's face, or or seems to get angry and all that. Uh, uh, on the other hand, Jesus got angry when they were, you know, selling the temple. And there is a place for righteous indignation as a motivation to serve. It's just not good to stay there too long. Um, it tends to make you as bad as what you're fighting. The last part then is to protect, and that's the prophetic voice. And again, in Papua New Guinea, it was no bugger up bush. I could just see this group of 50 Episcopalian leaders standing. I mean, this we're talking a world of spears and you know, I mean, they have guns, but they still traditionally hunt with spears and bows and arrows. And standing in the path of these bulldozers and saying no. You know, and, and that's the final point is that I, I am an activist because I love and because I serve. There's a point where we stand up. There's that verse in, in Proverbs, again, speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. You know, and it's time for us, for the environmental community and the faith community, 
that's in the labor community, and all of us to stand up and because what we're doing, we don't have to be ashamed, or we don't have to back down, because we are speaking for those that cannot speak for themselves. And if we don't do it, who will? Um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, I remember I was driving down the road, where we live, there's a chain called uh, Fred Myers. And Fred Myers used to build one leather stores with parking on top. He built the ramp. We're driving around, and my wife says, look, there's some man trying to push a woman off the roof. And I looked up, and there was this guy in this gap fighting on top of the roof over that balcony. So I pull over, and I run up the ramp. And now this gal is curled at the feet of this man. And the testosterone was really kicking in, you know. <laughs> and uh, I just was ready to get into it. What are you doing? I mean, it was time. Make this stop. Turned out, actually, I had read the situation wrong. She was <laughs> deaf, mentally ill, and was trying to kill herself. And that was her father trying to keep her back. She stood up and scratched him in the face and ran away down the ramp. And cried and I repented and we walked back. But I remember when I was watching this fight happen, part of me said, don't get involved. And the other part of me said, you got to get involved. you got to get involved. And I did get involved. And that was a lesson and it's happened other times where we all, we all been there. We're there with, I mean, if you're in the activist community, how many action alerts do you get a week? But there's a point where we have to find the time to do it. Maybe action alerts are little ways we tithe to God part of our time. You know, Lord, I'll give you a two action alerts a week. <laughs> I'll call my congressperson. Um, but it matters. There's a verse in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, that says, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Uh, no, no, wrong Ezekiel. Uh, oh, shoot. All right. Let me just uh, stumble back here for a second. Uh, but it says that he will hold his, uh, the shepherd accountable uh, for the sheep. Oh, here it is. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. It goes on and says, you eat the curds, you clothe themselves with the wool, you slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, nor healed the sick, or bind up the, bound up the injured. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against the shepherds, and I will hold them accountable for my flock. Now this is a metaphor about the leaders of Israel and how they took care of the people of Israel. But the Bible uses the illustration of the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd had power over the sheep. And yet, if you had 100 sheep, you were expected to come back at the end of the summer with 120 fatter sheep. And then we're coming back with five. You know, I'm going, Lord, thank you for the sheep, because I had mutton every night. You know, it was awesome. You know, and that's what happened in the salmon. You know, we're debating. You know, well, do we or do we not allow salmon to go extinct? You know, and I'm going. There, there's no way this can happen. So at Target Earth, we revel in a little bit of what we call the prophetic voice. We enjoy uh, going to these events and saying, "At Promise Keepers, I never get invited to the Promise Keepers." <laughs> <coughs> But I get to go, because I am a male. Um, and uh, I go there, and I just, you know, I have a little trick. I kind of saunter over, and I go, well, what do you do? And they tell me what they do, and then they're obligated to ask me what I do. And that's when I get to go, well, I'm a Christian environmental activist. And I work to bring the word that we are called to care for God's creation. And that always starts a dialogue. Or they're going like, OK, <laughs> um, here. Um, uh, but it's, an, it, it's really important. So with that, um, I'm basically done. I'd like to open it up to questions. We've got uh, a lot of time. Um, we can leave early. We can ask some questions. Um, I have these bumper stickers, by the way. We have your, your soul needs the wild. These are outdoor worthy. And the verse is Jesus went to the wilderness and prayed. We have your, I don't have very many of these, so I may not even offer these. Your extinction isn't stewardship. But if you deal with salmon or you deal with endangered species, this is pretty powerful. We've got, if you love the creator, take care of creation. And then my favorite is God's original plan was to hang out in the garden with some naked vegetarians. Uh, <laughs> so, this has been our uh, uh, ode to the, uh, 
Ode to the Humorless uh, in the community. And I'm going to pass around two sign-up sheets because I'm blatant enough to uh, uh, take advantage of a captive audience. Uh, I should have a pen. Um, if you have a pen, let's see, here's one pen. Um, if you're interested in knowing more and being on our, uh, our mailing list, uh, let me know. So, with that, any questions? Did I write a book? Oh no, I have a booklet. <laughs> <laughs> Moving up, but I, I had a pamphlet earlier, but now it's a booklet. Uh, on, uh, and it, this is this is um, what, what began to happen is you know there was so much suspicion in the church community. So the first part is a theological call to action done by a very conservative and very trusted group called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. There are college campuses throughout the country. So the leader of that wrote up a book for us. Then we have about 80 Bible verses. There's actually more Bible verses. Because when, I mean, you didn't have to get an MBA in business to recognize what's the best thing to use to build a relationship with Bible-believing Christians. Books from the Bible. And then in the back is a declaration on the care of creation, which is talking about, you know, a theological look at what we do to the earth and ends up with being about, uh, we have almost um, uh, a thousand evangelical leaders who have signed on. We don't have a thousand on here, which is foolish because I've got empty pages. And it's amazing how peer pressure makes things safe. People go, oh, okay, oh, I know him. Oh, I had him in college. <laughs> okay. And if you can see Elizabeth could tell you stories of just about the suspicion, the people, uh, uh, don't want to go there, no, no, no. But if we can have the conversation, we can win the conversation. Here's the evangelical arrogance I have. It's because I know it's true. And deep somewhere in the hearts of people, they know it's true too. They know God created a good earth. And that when we care for the good earth, we're better people for it. And it's pretty simple. Um, and the question is, how do we get enough people, you know, agreeing with that? And, and, and it's important, the hard part is getting Christians to stand up to the other Christians. Because I bet in Montana, again, you know, I mean, I'm amazed at the energy of this conference and the energy in Montana. And I think so many people have moved out here because they want to live, because they're already hardwired for appreciating nature. It's a, probably a pretty easy conversation. There's a little church, if you're local, called New Hope Fellowship. It's off on, I think, a fifth. And this is a young pastor, and I'm telling you a little secret here. I think he is, if people started coming to his church saying the earth matters, he would become a leader to talk about. But if nobody in his church does, I had a friend tell me, um, quit expecting us pastors to be spiritual leaders. He goes, most of us are managers of religious institutions. And that's painful, but it's true, folks. <coughs> You know, it's true. They've got mortgages. They've got all that. With this, we close. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank you. And, and again, we walk in love. We walk in service. And we walk in protect. We call it making our hearts bigger, our hands dirtier, and our backbone strong. But if we love the earth and we love the poor, then we are obligated to speak up for it in love, to serve, and to protect. The power is if you serve, then when you speak up and protect, you're that much more believable because you're walking the talk. Uh, if you're, if you're a, uh, uh, I've got bumper stickers here. You can have them. You can also throw me a donation. I'll never say no. I've got these Bible verses. I've got some of our magazines. And uh, we've got our, uh, this stuff from Naripa, the Wild Rockies. You know, I encourage you. They're a local group here, um, just in that big silver grain elevator thing. And I really, uh, really respect the thinking. They're just thinking out of the box. That's always dangerous. That's always tough to think out of the box. Um, so, thank you very much.